Welcome to Calvary Temple Church, here in the heart of downtown Winnipeg. Calvary Temple is people, people of all generations and all nations. Stay tuned for a message of hope and encouragement. Evidence that demands a verdict. I want to tell you a story this morning about a little boy. His name was Jeremy. Jeremy was what we would call today a special needs boy. He had a terminal illness. It affected both his emotional state and his physical state. His parents were trying desperately to give him a normal life, and so they found a Christian school that would allow little Jeremy to enroll. By the time we pick up the story, he was 12 years of age, and he was still in grade two. And he would go to school, and he would not interact very well with the other students, and it wasn't too clear how much he was taking in. But on this particular time, the teacher in this grade two Christian school class was teaching the children about springtime and Easter and the empty tomb. And so she was excitedly telling the story of how Jesus rose from the grave and Easter is about new life in Christ. And then she said, you know, this week I want you to take home this big plastic egg. And I want each of you students to put something in it that depicts new life. And she thought in her mind, you know, I need to phone Jeremy's parents and tell them what this is all about, but she forgot. And so when Easter rolled around and the next school day came, all of the children came with their Easter eggs and put them in the basket on the teacher's desk. And Miss Miller, the teacher, opened up the first egg and she said, oh, look in here, we have a flower. And this flower speaks of new life. It's a sign of new life of spring. And a girl at the back waved her arm and said, that's my egg, Miss Miller, that's my flower. The next one contained a plastic butterfly and the teacher commented about how butterflies come to life out of a cocoon. Then the next one had some moss in it on a rock and the teacher explained that moss showed life and the little boy admitted, I didn't know that, but my dad helped me find that. And finally, they got to this egg and the teacher opened it and there was nothing in it. And she thought, oh dear, I forgot to call Jeremy's parents. She did not want to embarrass him, so she wanted to just lay the egg aside and go on with class, but Jeremy would have nothing of that. He waved and he said, what about my egg? Comment on my egg. And she said, I don't know what to say. Your egg is empty. And Jeremy looked her right in the eyes and said, yes, Jesus' tomb was empty, just like my egg is empty. The empty tomb is truly the greatest symbol of new life and the fact that we can have hope. See, we need to ask the question today, is the empty tomb Christian Wishful thinking, as many, many nominal believers believe, well, it may not be literal, but it's a nice thought. Well, I want to challenge our thinking today about the fact that this is not folklore. This is not wishful thinking. If the resurrection is not true, then Christians need to stop talking about their faith because their faith means nothing. And so we're going to, along with Jeremy, talk about the empty tomb speaks of new life. Now I want to talk to you about the four named witnesses of John chapter 20. A quick survey of this amazing resurrection chapter reveals that only four were actually named. Now there were others present, but they weren't named. There were four of them. They were Mary Magdalene, 
They were Peter, John, and Thomas. Now, for our purposes this morning, we are going to take them in a little different order. And we're going to ask them to get on the witness stand, and we're going to see what they saw and who they were and what they were about. Now, the first one that I want to bring to the witness stand this morning is John. And we're going to call him John the Thinker. John the Thinker. He was the writer of this gospel, and he is so modest in the 20th chapter of John that he doesn't even refer to himself. He calls himself the other disciple. Notice, Peter and the other disciple, or John, started for the tomb and both were running, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Finally, the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb, went inside, and notice these words. He saw and believed. They still don't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. It would appear that John the thinker was the first one to really get it. He was putting together the pieces. He saw and he believed. Now, one might think that this Galilean fisherman would not get it. On the contrary, it seems that he was thinking at a different level than everyone else. He was more perceptive. It's pretty clear in the Gospels that he was braver. He was certainly braver than bombastic Peter. He actually saw Jesus take his last breath. He was that close. He was getting the bigger picture much much sooner. Notice in John 20 that he describes the grave clothes. He describes them as having a body that kind of lifted right out of them. He, um, you know, his understanding ties in directly to the gospel that he wrote. In fact, he seemed to, he got the concept that this Jesus was God. Listen listen to John in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. All things were made. Without him nothing was made that was made. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. John was a thinker. John connected the dots. He grapples with the Genesis creation story and puts the resurrected Jesus right smack in the middle of the resurrection of the of the generation of the Genesis creation story. And he connects the resurrection. If this isn't true, then that isn't true. You know, a week ago, we had the privilege of having Richard Fangrad here from creationministries.com. And boy, he was, for all the thinkers, he said some amazing things to us. I was absolutely encouraged in my faith. I don't have to uh, throw my brains away to believe in the resurrection. In fact, six-day creation can even work. Hallelujah. And he began to lay it out for us in a powerful way. Richard Fangrad, creation.com. So thinkers need to contemplate and put the dots together. 1 John 1, verse 2, we have seen it and we testify to it. This is John. Well, let's bring the second witness in for a moment. John the thinker. Now, Thomas the checker. Thomas the checker. You know, one of the one, most wonderful things about Christianity is this. That if you're a true follower of Jesus, you don't become anxious if someone wants to check it out. See, here's what cult leaders do. They say, no, you have to think 
just like me and you can't ask that question and you can't check that out. If you want to cause trouble around here, you stop it. I'm so glad that we are a people who can say, you want to know truth? You check it out. You check it out. And here's what happened. Well, so the other disciples told him, Thomas, old boy, we've seen the Lord. (laughs) He says, you're nuts. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. Wow. I was uh, on the air this past week with Jeff Courier at CJLB. I had an hour with him, and he wanted to talk to me about Easter. And um, so I took along this little booklet with me, and I gave him one. He was very thankful to receive it. It's called, Is Jesus Alive Today? And in it, there's a testimony. In fact, I'd like you to hear a little bit of Lee Strobel's testimony today. It's right in this book, Is Jesus Alive Today? He puts it this way, skepticism is in my DNA. That's why I combined the study of law and journalism to become the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, a career in which I relentlessly pursued hard facts. That's also why I was attracted to a thorough examination of the evidence as a way to probe the legitimacy of Christianity. As a spiritual cynic, I became an atheist in high school. To me, the concept of an all-loving, all-knowing, all-powerful creator was absurd and didn't warrant consideration. I believe that God didn't create people, but that people created God out of a fear of death and a desire to live forever in a utopia called heaven. Fittingly, he said, I married an agnostic named Leslie. Several years later, she came to me with the worst news possible. She had decided to follow Jesus. My initial thought was that she was going to turn into an irrational holy roller who would waste all her time serving the poor in a soup kitchen, and divorce, I figured, was inevitable. Then something amazing occurred. I saw positive changes in Leslie, her character, her values, and the way she treated me and the kids. That transformation was winsome and attractive, and when she invited me to church one day, I complied. The pastor spelled out the essentials, speaking the truth, in a talk called Basic Christianity. I did not become a convert that day, but if it was true, it had huge implications for my thought process. That's when I decided to apply my experience as a journalist to investigating whether there's any credibility to Christianity or other faith systems. So I resolved to keep an open mind and follow the evidence, even if it took me to uncomfortable conclusions. I thought my investigation would be short-lived. In my opinion, having faith meant you believed something you knew couldn't be true. In my opinion, having faith meant you believed something you knew couldn't be true. I anticipated that I would uncover facts that would devastate Christianity, yet as I devoured books by atheists and Christians and interviewed scientists and theologians and studied archaeology and ancient history and world religions, I was stunned to find that Christianity's factual foundation was a lot firmer than I had believed. Thomas the Checker. Thomas the Checker. Did you hear it? That's what our world thinks, that faith is somehow believing in something you know isn't true, but you just wish it were true. As believers today, as seekers who've come to Calvary Temple, as people watching on the internet or by television, We are never asked to base our faith on stupidity or ignorance. 
The Bible always invites you to check it out. Knock, seek, find, hunger, thirst, desire the Lord. Checkers need to verify. Checkers need to verify. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Praise God. Like Lee Strobel, like C.S. Lewis, and thousands of other seekers and hundreds in this room today, the literal physical resurrection of Jesus is what confronts us with irrefutable evidence. So we've brought a thinker to the stand, we've brought a checker to the stand, now I want you to bring a talker to the stand. Peter the talker. Now it's amazing that we call Peter the talker because in John 20 he doesn't say a word. But we know of his reputation, right? We know that Peter was always the one engaging and talking. Do you remember how Peter argued with Jesus about the foot washing? He said, you'll never do that to me, Jesus. And Jesus said, I better would do this to you. Do you know something about talkers? Talkers learn on their feet. Talkers, as they're talking, they begin to grasp. It's a process. Peter would get things as he was talking. In John 21, once again, this is the do you love me Peter speech and do you love me feed my lambs do you love me and then it came up about how Peter would die and uh, do you remember what Peter said to Jesus well that's fine if I'm going to die that way but what about John <laughs> and, and, uh, and Jesus said you know Peter that's really none of your concern." So Peter was one who in his talking, in his speaking, he would get it. He got a hold of something that he would talk about for the rest of his life. And we pick it up in Acts chapter 2. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ, or Lord and Messiah. How many are thankful that talkers can arrive at the truth? They actually can arrive at the truth. Talkers. And Peter, in some ways, was that kind of a person. But aren't you thankful that he got it? in his talking, in his interactions with Jesus, in his shock and horror, it dawned on him, and then he spent the rest of his life sharing the message of the resurrection. Talkers need to talk it out. Talkers need to talk it out. Like Peter said, be always prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks of you. Praise the Lord. So we brought a thinker to the stand today, and we brought a checker, and we brought a talker, and all three arrived at the same conclusion. Truth ultimately reveals itself to all of us. But then there's a very interesting woman her name is Mary Magdalene, the seeker. And we're going to bring her to the stand this morning, and we're going to have a little chat with her. I don't know if you ever go down to the Forks here in Winnipeg, but there, is, um, there are people in business down there who would be willing to, to test the spirits for you and figure out what's going to happen in your future, and some of them read leaves, and some read this and that, and use a deck of cards, and well, that was a little bit like Mary Magdalene's background. Mary Magdalene had been very involved in the occult. In fact, 
The scriptures tell us that she's the woman that Jesus set seven demons free from her, delivered her from the the power of the enemy. There, There is a dark world and there is Jesus' world and the spirit world of the angels and those who serve the Lord, but there's also this dark world and Mary Magdalene was set free from these demons. Now, when you are dramatically converted, it kind of sets you on a course for the rest of your life. I did a, um, I did a wedding yesterday uh, with a fellow pastor who I went to school with 40 years ago, and we were sitting in my office talking, and I said, you know what I remember about you, Roy? I remember that you were fervent. He said, you mean a fanatic? I said, well, that was close. But you see, when someone has been set free from the power of darkness, something is let loose in them that never quit seeking for more. More. Well, this was Mary Magdalene. Now, watch the seeking in her life. Watch it. She was not content for Jesus, the one who had set her free, to just vanish. He's gone. It's over. No way, she said. Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, She bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said. I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. I want you to know that this scene, this woman who had been broken and empty and not even filled with confusion and darkness and the demonic, trying to find answers in the New Age movement. Here she is, grieving and broken and crying and weeping all over the world and I mean this literally, all over the world, in thousands of different places, in thousands of different people, there are Mary Magdalene's this very day in darkness, in despair, in hopelessness, in weeping, in sadness, in depression, in anger, in confusion. And today, in churches all over the world, in Africa, in Korea, in many different places all over the world, Jesus will show up. In fact, often, he shows up and people think he's a gardener. They think he's the neighbor from next door who brought them to church. They think he's the friend from work who runs the lathe beside you, and he's always talking to you about Jesus being alive, and why don't you come to our church this Sunday morning? And guess what? The person comes and they listen to the hallelujah chorus and they listen to the scripture and they listen to the prayers and they hear the voice of Jesus. They think it was the neighbor. They think it was the friend from work. They think it was, but it was really Jesus. 
and he says their name. And this miracle happened in a moment of time. Sometimes it's the bedside nurse that came to Canada from the Philippines 25 years ago, and every time she gets a chance, she whispers the name of Jesus, and the person's heart was touched. Do you know, friends, seekers need to be found. Seekers need to be found. Mary Magdalene was in the garden, and Jesus needed to find her because she needed to be found. Hebrews 11, he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That'd be a good place to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so this morning, I don't know where you fit whether you feel more like John the thinker, whether you're more like Thomas the checker, whether you're more like Peter the talker, or whether you feel more like Mary Magdalene from a broken, dark past. Wherever you find yourself, Jesus wants to be found today, and he wants to speak your name, Mary. I've known all about you all your life. I've known every time you had that near-death experience. I've kept you for this moment. And I want to give you today one of these little booklets. If you are a seeker, if you are a checker, <laughs> If you have not yet come to the conclusion that Jesus is alive for you, at the close of this service, I want you to come and get one of these booklets. There is a prayer right at the back. Lord Jesus, I know I am a sinner. I have displeased you in many ways. Please come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Those watching by television, you write and get one of these. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence today on Resurrection Sunday. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching the broadcast. An audio recording of today's message is available simply for the asking. Write, email, or call our toll-free number and requested by the CD offer shown on the screen. Our program is viewer supported. It is people like you who help pay for the airtime. Thank you for your continued giving. We look forward to hearing from you. Please join us again next week for another episode of Calvary Temple Church. God bless you.